Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We're in Season 3. We've reached Episode 8, Flashes Before Your Eyes. We have Alan Dale with us this week for the first time. He plays Charles Widmore, making his second appearance on the show in this episode. And what an episode it is for old Charles Widmore. He is a real, real Son asshole in this one. <laughs> Sorry to Alan Dale, who's a phenomenal actor. <laughs> and a nice guy. Let's, uh, let's talk about the episode. As always, we are going to start this episode with our hot takes. There's a lot to say, so let's jump right in. Sammy, what is your hot take? So I know I've done this hot take before, but I just kind of have to complain about Charlie, who is yeah. who is so... He is so insecure, it's just kind of hard to take. When when Desmond is on the beach trying to save Claire's life and is, like, on the ground reviving her, and Charlie is just... Hey! Oh, God. Is she okay? Hey! What happened? Stand back, just give me some room. Hey! Hey! Get back, Charlie, I know what I'm doing. Is she breathing? She's not breathing? He literally says... Charlie's here. Oh, my God. And Charlie is just, like, pushing and pushing, and what can I do? And, dude, he's trying to save her life. Get out of the goddamn way. God, yeah. Like, my dude, stop making this about you. It's not about you. Not everyone is, like, trying to swoop in and steal Claire from you. Desmond is trying to save her life. I know. And that is going to require you to back up. And his jealousy is just out of control. Seriously, and I frankly, I didn't like it either later in the episode where I know he's trying to get Desmond to confess about what's going on, but when he's yelling at him and calling him a coward and saying that, um, y- you know, that, that there was some, I don't know, just making it seem like there was something wrong with what he did when what he did was save Claire's life. Right. So I don't know, it just... And it, I, 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 I guess I can understand that, you know, it seems a little sketchy here, like Desmond clearly seems to have some weird... Sixth Sense going on, and I guess Mr. Echo did just die under super mysterious circumstances, and the hatch explosion was only a few days ago, and I guess all in all, I can see how everybody's suspicions would sort of be on high alert, but that really doesn't seem like what this is about. This seems like Charlie is angry that Desmond won't include him in the secret or whatever. Right. And, and I think and I think the part where you really know that it's about Claire and about that that jealousy that you mentioned is when when Desmond is going and like chatting with Claire like amicably or Claire excuse me goes to chat with Desmond after she he saves her life right. and Charlie comes over and says, "Claire, where'd you go? I thought you said you'd only be gone for 5 minutes. The baby needs you." And it's yeah. like he just he's just not happy that that Claire is spending time with Desmond. Like, come on. Come on. She's not even spending time with him. She's saying, "Thank you for yeah. saving my life." Oh boy. We um we know that there are many fans of Lost who love Charlie dearly and we would love to hear from you about why we are <laughs> why we are wrong and why we are mistreating his character. Please feel free to call us with your hot takes uh, at 9546 <laughs> Dharma. Leave us a message or get at us on social media and we will tell everyone what you said about why we're wrong. I will argue that I do love Charlie dearly, and for that reason, it pains me to see him hmm. acting so immature, like, because we know he can be so much better. You know, but. I'll make my hot take even hotter then. I used to feel that way, and watching the show this time around, and all the conversations we've had about Charlie, I'm liking him less and less. Ooh. I mean, I just, I feel like all of our conversations about Charlie in season two were kind of similar to this one. That's true. And I thought that he was, you know, rehabilitating himself after the whole punching lock incident and stealing the uh, helping Sawyer, Sawyer steal the guns and knocking out Sun. And then at the beginning of this season, we just, you know, we get this and it's just, I know it's a minor thing in comparison, but I'm I'm really looking forward to, you know, hopefully having Charlie build up some goodwill before his unfortunate demise in the finale of the season. Yeah. That hasn't hoping. happened yet. Anyway, Rosie, what is your hot take? This is a very emotional flashback. It's heightened emotions the whole time, but they really bring it to this, horrible and painful climax when Desmond breaks up with Penny and it's so hard to be a viewer because you know why he's doing it he's doing it because he's traveling through time and um 
thinks he has this other purpose to fulfill. And, you know, what he tells her is, we're not supposed to be together. But, oh my god, what a horrible way to be broken up with. And that, you find out that that's where they got the picture Mm -hmm. that Desmond's been carrying around with him. And it's the only, well, it's not the only, but it's the primary token he has of Penny when he's on the island. And, ugh, it just stinks. Yeah, and that moment in the bar where he says, I think I've made the biggest mistake of my life. And the worst part is, I'm pretty sure I've made it before. Yeah, which is really interesting. I mean, we may as well just jump jump right into the the time travel aspect of this episode because when he gets back to the island after he gets hit with the cricket bat and knocks out, knocked out and kind of wakes up on the island, one of the first things he says is like, let me go back. I'll do it right this time. Mm, You know, I I won't do this again. And I was wondering a lot about whether it would ever be possible for him to go do it differently. And I don't, I don't know. I don't think we get that answer. I mean, I think it's the time travel thing to me is just, I mean, it's wonderful because it's the beginning of what we know is this long saga of of Desmond is this kind of unstuck in time character. Mm-hmm. who has these sort of mystical abilities to do things that other people can't. I mean, that seems to happen. That seems to happen, I think, because he turns the key and because yes, of I all agree. that electromagnetism that he's exposed to. Yeah, and nifty. it somehow, like, severs his relationship with the timeline that we are all related to, and he's able to move in this way. Here's a crazy idea. What if sure. season three had started with what happens after Desmond turns the key with, with basically a version of this episode. Who, I mean, I was just thinking it's such a satisfying resolution to flash back and to see the key turn and then to immediately launch into like, holy shit, what's going on? He's somewhere else. He's on the floor covered in paint. Like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like at the end of season two, that's what I want so badly to mm. see what happens after he turns the key. And then they make you wait eight episodes for it. Like, it's great when it shows up, but I kind of wonder if this would have been more compelling than the stuff they actually did start the season with. It's such a good episode. It is such a good episode. I I worry that from the writer's perspective, that would have been just a bit of a bridge too far. Like all of a sudden in episode one, like now we're time traveling. Hmm. Um, Maybe. I think I have no knowledge of this at all, but I I could understand a point of view that says like that might be a little too much for the viewers right now. Instead, we'll kind of stick with what we know on the island and then we'll get into this really sort of ridiculous new element. Uh, ridiculous in a very good way. Yes. <laughs> uh, a little later. Hmm. That makes sense. And I guess probably they also wouldn't have wanted to, after ending season two with a Desmond Flash, to immediately start with a Desmond Flash when you've got all these other characters with much longer tenures on the show than Desmond. But yeah, that's fair. Maybe, maybe, maybe I just think they should have done it sooner than episode eight. Well, like, I mean, part of that is that the first sort of six episodes could probably have been four, and you know, yes, we did. We did just experience that. What is largely viewed as one of the weaker arcs on the show it's true so in contrast i mean this looks like an outstanding episode although it is but (laughs) it looks even better by comparison i gotta say and we'll you know you talk to allendale about this later the scene with with widmore and desmond and the mccutcheon whiskey i think has got to be one of my favorite scenes on the show like it's brutally Mm. difficult to watch but it's it's like magnetic his speech about the whiskey this swallow it's worth more than you could make in a month. And to share it with you would be a waste and a disgrace to the great man who made it. Because you, Hume, will never be a great man. Yeah. What, uh, yeah. what were your highlights? Oh my gosh. Um, so just the experience of figuring out what's happening to Desmond is very enjoyable as a viewer because we are figuring out with him that he's time traveling. Mm, um, nice. Because at the beginning, it just feels like a flashback and a clever one because he wakes up in what looks like a Dharma suit in covered in what looks like blood. 
and then you find out it's not and you're you're kind of like oh well fun little games the writers are playing with it and then as you go on we start to realize that Desmond is aware that he's in the flashback and it's you know it's a mm. flashback in the sense that all of this has happened before um and all of it will happen again I was just thinking someday that. we'll do the Battlestar Galactic podcast <laughs> um <laughs> But he, you know, we start to become aware of it as he does. And, you know, initially I couldn't tell if he, this had already happened or if he was experiencing this for the first time. And then it starts to feel like, okay, he is experiencing this as though it's the first time, but he starts to figure out when, when he is, I guess. And, you know, (laughs) he knows what's coming and I guess that makes it so much worse. Um, And then he, Eloise Hawking shows up. For the first time, by the way, we what? don't know she's Eloise Hawking. No, no, but um, I totally forgot that that happened. Yeah. Um, you know, and she gives him a very, very difficult talking to in terms of, you know, it doesn't really matter what we do. Like, fate's going to win out anyway. Um, course correcting. Yeah. I remember that was a thing when she said course correction. I felt like, oh, I feel like I should drink now. <laughs> <laughs> I To me, the big metaphysical question about all that was kind of the did this really happen question right like is this now how it really played out in desmond's past that he had this talk with miss hawking does that displace how it happened the first time is it is it a separate timeline now is if if he had stayed and given her the ring would that just been a have been a timeline that continued and if so what would have happened to his island self this is always the problem with time travel right like do you go back (laughs) and erase the existing timeline do you tape over it or do you create a new save as yeah, and create nice a new one. Which is why I'm really um, wondering what's going to happen in the Loki TV show after the events of Avengers Endgame. But that's a that's another topic. <laughs> More time travel problems. Side note: um, I don't know that there's ever a point where they go back and and change something. No, and in they fact, go back there's... and basically fulfill the events of the past. That's right. They fulfill the incident, basically. Right. And the, the, there's a whole episode in season five titled "Whatever Happened Happened," where right. I think it's. I think it's either Hurley or Miles who makes a speech trying to explain the rules of time travel and how you can't actually change what came before. <laughs> right. You you can go back and sort of play a different role in it, but but course correcting. Right. Um, And I think that seems to sort of be the version of time travel that Lost chooses. Like, ultimately, you know, there's no, there's no going back and killing baby Hitler to use a sort of popular metaphor um yeah for sure it's gonna it's gonna end up the same in a larger sense anyway this is super hindsight territory but that to me was what was so exciting about um the episode the variable at the end of season five where you know the variable which is kind of the um you know the counterpoint to to the constant in season four which is where daniel faraday makes the speech of all this time i was studying time travel thinking that you couldn't change the past I realized I was focused so much on the constants when I really should have been focused on the mm-hmm. variables, human beings. We have free will. We can change things. We can do what we want. And that ties right into, I think, what you hear this episode from uh, from Desmond in his response to Miss Hawking. He says, no, uh, I can choose what I want to do when, when she says to him, you do it because you're supposed to. And but he, But he can't. Well, that's the question. Could he have? I mean... Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think Lost, you know, like generally comes down on the side of course correcting and you can't change the past. But I don't know. What if Desmond had just followed through with his decision and decided I'm giving Penny this ring? What if? Right. I mean. And why couldn't he have? Yeah. Counter argument, I guess, would be that Desmond was never going no version of desmond in that moment was ever going to be ready to propose to penny Mm. because of his his own insecurities because of his need to be sort of honored by charles widmore right all all of the things that he sort of alludes to in that very messy breakup speech where he says you know they they sort of spat over whether he was going to move into her flat or she was going to move into his and he's insecure about their class differences and he wants to be respected by Charles Woodmore. And there was clearly a lot of other things going on here. Like they seem like on the most part they were happy, but I I wonder if 
if Desmond, like, every time he returns to this moment is going to sort of have to live through the other things surrounding this, the sort of humiliation at Charles Woodmore's hands, being broke, etc. Like, could he have ever risen up from that to pro- to actually propose to Penny? God, that's such an interesting question. You know? Well, this this obviously gets into the meat of what's really happening with Desmond's character here. Right. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking that you, you may very well be right. I was thinking that one of the, one of the issues that I wanted to raise this episode, and even as you started to make that point, I wanted to raise was the question of, is Desmond really a coward? Because I remember when, when we talked with Henry and Cusick last year, I, I asked him that question, you know, Widmore keeps calling Desmond a coward. And, and in this episode, you hear it from Penny and, and, he says, no, I never understood that. You know, I didn't think he was a coward. And you, you know, you made the point about his his insecurities, is the word I think you just used, being what prevents him from moving forward with it here. But 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 then I, I sort of think maybe maybe it really is cowardice. Maybe maybe mm-hmm. it maybe it is more than insecurity. Because I was I was thinking you you said you said, you know, would he was there any version of him that could have been ready to do this? And I was thinking, well, I mean, when is any of us ever ready to do everything in life? Like, I'm sure we've each had moments (laughs) where it's like, we knew we weren't ready to do a thing, but we did it anyway. And couldn't Desmond have done that? But no, not if he wasn't brave enough to do it, because that's a thing that requires bravery, is doing something that you're not ready to do or feel like you're not capable of doing. Sorry, I'm just taking you through my whole thought process here. (laughs) This is going through my mind as, as... you know, so 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 maybe you're right. Maybe maybe he really doesn't. You know, maybe he really is a coward, and maybe that's why he couldn't have done this. I wonder if there's something to be said for cowardice as cowardice as the reason that people sort of go along with the prescribed order of events, and bravery being the counter of that. And it, it takes bravery to to mm. act differently, and maybe maybe like Eloise Hawking's take on things is fundamentally something of a, a cowardly take. I think you're onto something. I mean, if it, it, it's it's sim- it, it's probably too simplistic, but right. equating free will and 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 not doing just what you're supposed to do as bravery and going along with it as a form of cowardice, I, I think that actually makes a lot of sense at least as we see things play out in this episode. Yeah, because I I agree with you. I think, and I agree with, with Ian's interpretation too, that I I do not see Desmond as a coward. I don't see cowardice as one of his like fundamental character traits, but his character did have sort of so many roadblocks that didn't really need to be there. Hmm. Like a lot of them were in his own mind definitely his his need for Widmore's approval and the whole you know thing about needing to be a great man that being a good man wasn't enough right like those are things that you're totally right those are things his he that are in his own head stumbling blocks that he has placed in front of himself right and I, I don't equate those with cowardice but they do certainly keep him from doing things that he wants to do <laughs> I mean he wants to be with Penny he just wants all of these other things to be resolved first and that's what that's what isn't going to work. Yeah. And it's I don't know, it's and it's so hard because I mean you, I you, I think we see for the first time in this episode like Desmond and Penny's love for each other like really spelled out on screen. Yeah. Like and it's just it's so sweet and seems so pure and Yeah. I mean, I don't know, it's it just it feels like why Desmond like it should be so easy for you to lean into this. Right. But it isn't. Right. One of the toughest things for me is that Desmond Penny is right. He is a fundamentally good man, right? Yeah. Like we see that in all sorts of different ways. And so it's just, it's frustrating for whatever, you know, reason it is or why the stumbling blocks are there, whether it's cowardice or insecurity or something else. It's it's frustrating that he's so susceptible to this idea that he's not good enough, that he's not a great man when right. he seems like someone any of us would be lucky to be, you know, friends with or close with or, I mean, yeah. it's just... It's ridiculous. Yeah, and why why isn't that enough? Yeah. For him. I mean, poor guy. I mean, I guess probably in part because 
Penny is wealthy and came from a high-powered family. And, I mean, it's not just her. I mean, it's internal to him as well, but it's just... Right. Uh. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, Dem- Desmond definitely has baggage in terms of I'll never be part of her world and I'll never be, you know, she's this heiress to this huge fortune and I'll sort of never be welcome in those spaces on one hand, but if Penny invites him into those spaces, he kind of will be well, you know, it'll, it'll be a little awkward, but he doesn't want to, he wants to get there on his own merits. He doesn't just want to sort of show up as Penny's guest. Well, I think that's why he doesn't take the job too, because he feels like it's not his own merits. Right. Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, I'm, I've been thinking just about Penny, like the amount of faith that she has in Desmond is astounding. Mm. I mean, she could, after, you know, after they split up, some amount of time passes before Desmond leaves her his race around the world. Yes. Um, and she gets engaged to someone else, by the way. Yeah, like, they're still in the same... Desmond is not on the island for, like, months to years. Yeah. Um, I think we see in, the flashback is in, like, 1996. Um, in, con- in the constant it is. Yeah, so he would end up on the island in, what, 01? If he's been there for three years... Yeah, that sounds right. So, geez, this is probably like a six or seven year period of separation. Yeah, so five years pass, and they're like they're still both in you know terrestrial time, <laughs> and could <laughs> theoretically contact each other. And yeah, Penny gets engaged to someone else, and and yet she's still willing to go search for him. She's right. still willing to wait for him to be the constant. Like, holy crap, <laughs> poor Penny. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, true love, right? I <laughs> <laughs> I was raised on Disney movies. Sure. <laughs> and this is a Disney TV production, so... I don't know, it's believable, though. There's something about it with the two of them yeah. that it's like, I, I buy it. Yeah, I agree. Anything else on your mind this week? One thing this I don't know if this is so much a hindsight as if this whole episode hasn't really been been hindsight but um or is it a foresight? When, oh, ooh. Ooh. sorry. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um when Eloise Hawking says to Desmond that pushing that button is the only great thing you'll ever do. That just seems wrong. Like yeah, especially after the finale when he does the thing with the giant plug. Right. I mean and Desmond, bringing them all together in the afterlife. Sorry, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> even, even in the context of the island and sort of keeping the island's power at bay, he does greater things. But yeah. I guess at this point in the show, we kind of need... We need to hear this because the button was recent. But... Well, and I guess pushing the button did, you know, did do something. It did sort yeah. of keep the electromagnetism contained. Yeah. But I, I agree with you. And, and honestly, even if it's true, it's just such an asshole thing to say to someone. A lot of asshole moves in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Ella, Eloise Hawking and Charles Widmore made for each other. Yeah. Actually, my, my hindsight was that um, I had forgotten that Desmond had like the physicist friend who he asks about time travel. Oh, yeah. And it's, especially with Eloise and, and Charles around, I thought, gee, it's a shame that they couldn't have introduced Daniel Faraday here. Right. He would have been perfect for that role and, of course, serves that role in the next Desmond Flash episode. Time travel episode, I should say. But they're not friends at that time, right? Like, Desmond looks him up to go... No. Yeah, but Desmond could have been like, gee, I wonder who my local time travel expert at Oxford is. Do-do-do-do-do. Daniel Faraday. I guess they probably didn't have widespread internet access in... 1996. No, what, Do you what think they, the writers had come up with Daniel Faraday at this time? No, probably not. Which is why yeah. it's a silly hindsight. But, but he's less than a season away. Ugh. Another one of my favorites. Yes, the mumbler Jeremy Davies. Ah, <laughs> oh. boy. Should we? Anyway. Um, yeah, interview. Yeah. Um, so Sammy had the chance to sit down with Alan Dale. Actually, the same day that he sat down with Gene Higgins. Um, two very different conversations, but Alan seems like a lovely man. 
Um, uh, he is. He invited me over to his home in Manhattan Beach, which is, uh, for, for those of you not familiar with the geography, a nice little beach city to the south of Los Angeles. We sat outside on his uh, his patio. There were some renovations happening on his house. You might hear a little bit of noise, but uh, but lovely conversation for sure. We'll be talking to Alan over the next two weeks about his thoughts on Lost broadly, as well as the character of Charles Woodmore. So I'm here with Alan Dale, who played Charles Widmore on Lost. Alan, thanks very much for talking with us on The Hatch. Great pleasure. So let's, uh, let's start right at the beginning. How, um, how did you get this role? Uh, Disney. Yeah. yeah. It was at Disney Studios. I remember going out and doing the audition. Now, I forgot about it. I didn't realize I forgot that I'd done it. And then I think I was doing something else at the same time, another show. And, and then, I, then they called and said, will I come and do this? And I didn't know, you know how long it was going to be for. And it turned out to be for the rest of the show. <laughs> Did you know about Lost at that point? Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'd we'd watched it, and um, it was sort of intriguing. It had some you know, good, um, very good writing and some good acting in it. So, yeah. You know. And and when you when you did that, you just thought it was it was a guest. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was really right to yeah. the end. It was always a guest. Right. Um, he was never a regular. My character was never a regular in the right. show. So um, so I had, I had other jobs while I was going on. At one point. Um, Heavens, uh, in 2008, we'd be going, be going for about three or four years. Um, I was in London doing Spamalot, playing right. playing the king in, Sp- in Spamalot on the West End, and uh, and they needed me to come over and do some scenes when I couldn't get the time off. So because I was we were doing eight episodes, of, uh, eight shows a week, and uh, so. They had to come to London to shoot some scenes. That's funny because, um, you know, I totally spoke with Jean Higgins this morning. I think she said that that was the only time they ever filmed out of Hawaii right. when they went to join you for Spam a lot. Yeah. So it was yeah. just because they, they, it yeah. really, I, I wasn't a regular. If I had sure. been, then I'd have been there. But, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do the, the West End thing and some of the other things. I was, oh, that's right. I was also doing um, Ugly Betty at the same time. Ugly Betty, too. Okay. Mm, yeah. So I, I, I went back and I watched the first two scenes that you were in. Um, and at any rate, it was just you were in one scene at the end of season two, and then you showed up in one scene in season three as well, which is which is funny because you, you make an impression, right? I mean, it's a character that feels like, you know, by the time you get there at the end, even though it's just been sort of some spread out cameos, you know, fans felt like they were familiar with you. You know, you were this lurking evil behind mm. the scenes figure. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think Widmore makes such an impression? Well, you know, is it... Too- I don't actually know how it turned out because as it turned out the end of the show changed everything. But um, my assumption was that he was the guy behind it all, you know, hmm. and that's what sort of like the impression I got from everything. But they didn't really ever tell me. But he seemed to be the man behind the whole thing. So, you know, if you wanted to know what was going on, Charles Woodmore was the guy that could tell you. It seemed to me. Hmm. But um, but you didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I, did, I just went and did my job. You know, I, I didn't know from one time to the next what was going on interesting mm. we I, I spoke last year with with sonia walder who plays your daughter on the show and um mm. i asked her do you think there's anything redeeming about charles widmore and i thought she would have a, a complex answer and she's just kind of laughed and said no i don't think so no. do you think so um no no i i, I mean he was he was um, a manipulative you know, guy that got his own way, and uh, you know, he's very, he's uh, similar to you know our president, I would imagine, uh, similar sort of character. Didn't care about anyone else but himself. A bit. Um, she didn't. She wasn't in the show long, though, or didn't do many scenes. Well, certainly, I only ever met her once. That, well, that's interesting because I, I don't know if you ever even shared a scene together. No, I don't think we did. But that's... we happened to be in Hawaii at the same time once and caught a van together, and so we spoke briefly. But um, it was really interesting, though. What was really interesting yeah. to me, and it probably may not be to you, but was um, that I started to do Dynasty, and one of the beautiful girls that played one of the leads in the first season of Dynasty announced to me that she was that girl's sister. Sonia's sister? Mm. Really? Mm. Natalie... What's her other name? Well, well, Walger is Sonia's last name, but maybe that's no, a well, married see, name. I'm they, not had, sure. they, had the, they were half-sisters, and, and they shared the same father, an Englishman, huh. who went out to... I'm not sure if it's Chile or Argentina, Chile, I think, where, you know, where Natalie was born, right. but he already had the older daughter who was English, who was 
who huh. played my daughter. And I had no <laughs> idea until Natalie told me in the bus one day, in the makeup bus, she, she said, oh, you might have worked with my sister then, she said, on Lost. And I said, well, I might have. What's her name? I didn't recognise it because I only right. ever met her once. Yeah. And um, she said, yeah, she, she, um, uh, she was the love interest of um, Ian's character. And I went, well, that's my daughter. <laughs> no, no, that's how I found out. It was amazing. Hollywood is small, isn't it's it? It's a very small place. So if you know you're playing the character that you see on the page, Charles Widmore, you don't know really, you know, what's going on besides what you have on the page. I guess I'm I'm curious what you thought about his his motivations, like how. What, I had to make up. Yeah, I had to make up my motivation. Well, what did, what did you make up? Um, I each, but in each yeah. situation, yeah, I had to. You know, I'd read the script and then I had to decide... Because, I mean, I wouldn't even get the script between the ones that I was in. So, huh. you know, if I wasn't in for three or four weeks, I, I never saw a script. So I didn't even know where I was coming from, where I was going. One of the frustrations of doing a show like that, really. Sure. But um, I thoroughly enjoyed being involved. The writing was always good. And so in each individual scene, I made up my own sort of story. I mean, based upon... The facts that were in the script. Yeah, I mean, what, what did you think? Was he was he just totally power hungry? Did he did he have did he have anything that wasn't that as a motivation? Well, you know, it's so interesting to be asking these questions because when you look and see what happened in the end, then it didn't really matter what the motivations were because it was all just a, a, a plane crash. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. so when we then go back now and ask questions about what was his motivation, well. I don't even know. Was he in the plane crash? Was he? No, he wasn't in the plane crash. No. So he was just a figment of people's imagination. Oh, I, I don't know that I agree with that interpretation okay. well, of the show, but no, that's, that's okay. Quite, well, you know a lot more about it than me because it's a thing that you study. Right. You know, I've, I've done like right. ten shows since then. So right. I, I, um, yeah, I guess I just watching the character, it, it, it feels like he, it feels like he shifts at times. Sometimes he just seems like he wants, you know, to be in charge of everything. He wants to run the island. Sometimes it seems like he's trying to protect his daughter. Like maybe that, That's the best I can come up with for maybe a good motivation that he had. Well, I think that that's about all you can. And then he, he loved the power, and he loved to be a, a bit of a shit to people, as he was, to, to Ian with the, with, the, with the glass of scotch that time. Oh, that is a hard scene to watch. I watched that the <laughs> other night. It is Because you think it's going well. You think he's mm. going to bless the marriage and mm. everything, and then he tells him he's not worth drinking the whiskey. No. Awful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you usually play characters that are that are that bad, or is this well? Unusual? You know, I, um, probably internationally, the, the character that I played that was most famous, though not in America, as it happens, um, because the show never showed here. Really, it's a show called Neighbours, which okay. I made in Australia, and I did that for eight and a half years, and I played Australia's favourite dad. Hmm. So when I got to America <laughs> in my fifties. I said to my new agent that I, as I, and my new manager, I said, the only thing I would like is to play bad guys. I don't want to play good guys. Really? It's so boring being a good guy. So you enjoy playing, oh, playing yeah. Widmore? Oh, yeah. That was such fun. I mean, it's, it, you know, the twists and the turns, you know, and um, what can I get away with here, you know? How can I, how could, I, can, I mean, it's written like this, I can play it like that, or I could play it like that a little bit, and then a little bit like that, you know, and that's what I like to do, and it's fun. And I've had a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I, I started off this character as supposed to be a bad guy, um, but they've sort of what happens. Writers, they get it, you get on with the writers, and they decide to make you a good guy because they like you. You know, right? And you sort of think, no, 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 <laughs> do me a favour, just write me a bad guy. So, anyway. well, I feel like with Lost Widmore, I mean, he sort of has a a little bit of a redemption at the end. He comes back to the island. He says he's been changed and he wants to help now. But I. I feel like he's just about the closest the show comes to a pure villain, because you know Michael Emerson's character Ben kind of turns out to be a good guy, and um, Jacob turns out to be okay, and they get a real villain in the last season who you come and help them fight against. But you know through the course of that show, you're you're the big bad. I feel like. Well, I think that's true, but I'm not entirely sure whether that was planned a long way ahead or whether that was just how it evolved. You know, I think there's a lot of you know evolution in the way that it, the way that it was written. Yeah. Um, um, and, and it seems to be with a lot of shows. I mean, I've watched shows that, that, that had the same sort of result, and I've, I was a bit, as a as a viewer, I find it frustrating because you don't you don't know what what happened. I mean, even at the end of Lost, what really happened, you know? And right. and so, how did Woodmore fit in? So, in the end, I, I was going insane trying to figure it out. So, I forgot about it because <laughs> because you know uh, because first of all, 
uh, he wasn't on the flight as far as I know. Second of all, it was established some years in that he couldn't be killed. Right, Ben And then says finally he, he was him. shot. Right. But he couldn't be killed, I thought. I think Ben couldn't kill him. Uh, Michael Emerson's character. Oh, you, you think that's what it was? But he did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did in the end, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. It's so, a good question. Yeah, you know, I mean, so when you're asking me questions about it, these are the things that, that in my mind, right. when I bring in, them up, and it's probably not very satisfying um, okay. for everybody um, listening, but it is the way that it was, um, it evolved. I mean, brilliantly conceived and, and a wonderful idea, and, I mean, they've tried to make shows that uh, are good ever since, you know, um, and lots of variations on that, especially nowadays with so much being made. But, you know, they were the first to do it. It was pretty clever. The first to do what? What do you mean exactly? Well, to do this whole, um, you know, have a plane crash and then and then, what would happen? What could happen with that? Mm. I mean, how did, they, how did they figure it out? How did they sit there and go, I know, we'll have some people have a plane crash, only what will happen is they'll end up on this island. And, I mean, who thought of that? How did that come up? I mean, who, it, that's very, very creative. It is. I also want to ask, I think the two actors you probably worked with the most were, were Ian Desmond and, and Michael Emerson, who played Ben, right? Mm-hmm. What, what was it like to work you know, with those two actors and to do scenes together? Well, interesting. Have you talked to Ian? At all? Yes, we've actually talked to both of them. Right. Well, Because Ian, of course, he will have told you how he got the part. Yes. And, and, and the driving across London on a Friday night trying to get it to the yes. place in time <laughs> and all that stuff. Well, we, we sat and talked about that only a few weeks later. In Hawaii, because, you know, and of course it was, for him at the time, was an enormous shock because he was living in London in the middle of winter and suddenly, you know, like almost immediately overnight, he's, yes, you're hired, now you're in Hawaii. And, you know, so it was quite a, a good, solid actor and a nice bloke. Um, Michael, he's a, he's a difficult guy to know, really. Because hmm. I, I went, then I, I came back and after the show, he was doing Person of Interest. Yes. And, New York, and I ended up going and doing an episode of that as the bad guy again in, in Person of Interest. So it was nice to catch up with him again. But he it was so interesting. He didn't like it in Hawaii because he's used to the big city and he likes to be in the city. So he, he got a place in the middle of um, uh, the cityest part of Hawaii, like uh, Waikiki, and, um, and sort of lived as if he were living in a big city. But he wasn't. He's not a sort of an outdoorsy sort of guy. Interesting, interesting. But uh, but he was a lovely actor, of course, super nice. What was it like in the last season when you finally got to you know come spend a lot more time there? And I mean, I assume you got to work with a lot more of the actors in that last. It is, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and you got to do some gunfights and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know any of the people really. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I did know um, uh, Matthew Fox. Okay. Because he lived here, and his daughter was in the same class. Here, as my here son. in Manhattan Beach. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Um, I think he, last I mean, he did so well. He was buying private airplanes and things, you know. By the end of it, and I was just a day player, you know, because like, I'm getting paid sort of like the little money, and he's getting enough to buy airplanes. So yeah. it was a bit different for me. But I'm older, so it doesn't matter that much. Right. But did you enjoy that getting to go? Did you feel more like part of the show? At yes, that I did a bit. Yeah, yeah. I would have liked to have been a regular. I would have liked it, but it would have changed my whole life. It's funny to me that. Alan intentionally, at one point in his, his career, decided he only wanted to play bad guys. Yes. <laughs> and set out to do that. And he did play a number of bad guys around this time. Um, he succeeded. I mean, he got to play the the big bad, or I guess like the second big bad in Lost. He was also a, um, I remember at the time, he was a villainous vice president on 24 as well. Oh, he was. He was the one trying to remove David Palmer from office, I think. That's right. Yeah. Glad you remember that, too. (laughs) 24 and Lost were on. I don't think they were on back-to-back, but they were both very much of the same era. They were, and of the same, uh, probably the same types of fans. Anyway, (laughs) I just thought it was nuts that he, like, I I, I realized this while I was talking to him, but the fact that he and Penny were never in a scene together. That's amazing. I know, for all of the time that those two characters spent, like, you know, father and daughter, and they're so, you know, obsessed about each other, like... yeah. Kind of weird. Also yeah. thought it was funny that he tr- clearly did not understand the ending of the show. That's okay. Not everyone did. <laughs> but he'll, uh, we'll be back with Alan uh, next week. Um, his character doesn't appear, but we'll, uh, we'll finish up the interview with him. What we do have next week is Stranger in a Strange Land. This is true. The tattoo episode. 
<laughs> the infamous Jack Goes to Thailand and Gets Tattoos episode. We will get through it together and perhaps enjoy it. Anything is possible with God. <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, we are on Facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast and at, on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast. If you enjoy The Hatch, please uh, leave us a rating on your podcast app of choice. You can write a review as well if you're feeling particularly kind. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen, and her cover art is by Danny Roth. And we will see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.